This is House Planning Help, episode 25. Hi, I'm Ben Adam-Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in reducing the amount of energy you use at home, either by building or retrofitting a property. I'm on that path myself, and I'm learning about what's possible in the 21st century. In this session, Elrond Burrell from Archetype is my guest as we look at some of the myths of Passive House. Well, it's all go at the moment. The UK Passive House Awards takes place next month and my production company, Regen Media, is producing some video inserts for that event. I'm very excited and happy to be a part of this, so it's great news all round. Plus, has some bonuses here that once these videos are created, I'll be able to link to them in the show notes and so you can go and take a look at them as well and see how Passive House is moving forwards in the UK. And it's an opportunity for me to go and see some of these first-hand perks of the job, you see. So if you want to take a look at the contenders, I'll also link those up in today's show notes, which are houseplanninghelp.com forward slash 25. Secondly, something rather funny. In episode 24, I interviewed Jonathan Hines from Archetype about a new housing scheme for Kingstone, Herefordshire. I tend to do these interviews in advance so that I'm all planned and know where I'm going. But on the day the episode was released, Archetype, in conjunction with Archer House, received planning approval for the development. What are the chances of that happening that it was on the actual day that I released the podcast? So I'd just like to say a massive congratulations to you guys. And we're staying with Archetype for this episode. This is for the main content. I'm speaking to Elrond Burrell. He's my guest. Slightly different today because we're going to tackle some of the misconceptions of Passive House. So we're going at those head on. And I heard Elrond's being interviewed by Matthew Cutler-Welsh on the Homestar Green podcast a little while ago and just loved his enthusiasm for Passive House and thought, right, we're going to have to get him on our podcast. And this, for me, is the perfect opportunity. I started by asking Elrond about his background in architecture and how he found out about Passive House. Well, I'm from New Zealand. I've been in the UK for over 15 years now. So I did my um, university training as an architect in New Zealand and then qualified in the UK as an architect. I've been working at Archetype for six and a half years now. And before then, I'd been working on sustainable or green architecture for a number of years and particularly liked Archetype's approach. And it was working at Archetype when, as a company, we became more aware of Passive House and decided that some of the buildings we were doing, we were going to take down that route. And so... Pretty much that's how I've learned about Passive House. I wasn't aware of it before then. So what Archetype had been doing was quite close in some ways to the Passive House standard, but not going quite that far and not not measuring the performance of the buildings or the comfort of the buildings to the same level or the same degree that Passive House does. It might be worth going through this again, just for anyone who hasn't checked out some of the other episodes that we've done, but a quick overview of Passive House itself. Okay, so Passive House is a performance standard for a building, so it's not specific to a type of building, although it's often thought of around houses. It's also used for schools and for offices and a number of different types of buildings. Um, It was developed over 20 years ago by a Swedish and a German building physicist, so two of them working together, looking at essentially what were classified as eco or green buildings and kind of asking the question, why didn't they perform as well as they were predicted to do so? And by doing a lot of uh, careful analysis of those buildings and of the physics, coming to appreciate the aspects of the building that where that gap was essentially. So where you design something, you think it's going to perform a certain way, you think it's going to be comfortable, and then you find out actually it's got cold drafts or actually it uses more energy than you'd hope. And then just really getting into the detail of the physics about that to understand why that is. So getting beyond good intentions. And um, and what they've kind of established was that for a building to be um, comfortable, needs to be airtight, needs to be well insulated so it's warm, needs to be well ventilated so there's always fresh air for people. And using the, the European standard for what those definitions are for comfort, And they also, because they're coming at it from the green and the energy efficient side of things, looked at how is that 
achievable by using the least possible amount of energy. So you can do a kind of really simple comparison. You can say if you've got coffee in the office that sits there on a hot plate, you're putting energy into it all the time to keep it bubbling over, keep it warm. That's one approach, and that's the kind of typical building approach. Um, and the other approach is you have a thermos flask, which you heat the water up or you heat the drink up, and you put it in the thermos flask, and then you keep it warm by keeping the lid on. So a passivist building works the same way, that you need to provide some warmth in the building, and that is provided through solar energy from the sun, through occupancy heating, so movement or cooking or TVs or computers or things provide a certain amount of heat, lighting. But by having the building built correctly and well insulated, that heat is kept in so that you're not losing it. And then by getting the ventilation system to work properly with that, um, you're retaining the heat by using a, a heat recovery system, the ventilation. So instead of throwing out all your warm air and bringing in cold air, which you have to reheat again, you're keeping the warmth while throwing out the old air and bringing in fresh air that gets preheated by the uh, heat exchanger. Yesterday, I went on a site visit of a house. I don't think it was a certified passive house, but it was quite interesting that the owners, when they first moved in, they were a little bit cold and neither the husband or the wife said anything to each other because it takes a bit of time to, to kick in or you need to get the house up to temperature first. Is this a phenomenon you've ever heard of before? Well, it depends on a number of factors, I would say. Um, if you've got a lot of mass in your building, so if you've got concrete floors or things like that, then that does take a little bit longer to warm up. So any thermal mass in a building will absorb the heat while it's there and then will emit it again when it's lower, when there's a lower temperature. So it just kind of balance things out. But it's a very slow, you know, it's referred to as a thermal flywheel in a way. It takes a long time to build up, then takes a long time to cool down again. Um, so that's one reason possibly. If it wasn't the case, if it was a lightweight building and they didn't have any any heat input at all and it wasn't a sunny day, then it may have been a bit cool to start with. But the advice on that one is usually that to do a bit of cooking or to do a little bit of exercise in the house or do the vacuuming, sometimes people say, and uh, you know that generates a little bit of heat and then the building will keep that heat so it'll warm up fairly quickly. I thought it was interesting. It, once they got past a certain state, they haven't looked back, but just to have that initial worry of, oh, my goodness, I, the house hasn't been built properly, and then suddenly you get it up to temperature. I think, I think just thought, I mean, that is a really interesting story. Actually, I've not heard that one before, but there has been a bit of a myth around that a passive house building heats itself, or it's kind of been termed in English that a passive house building heats itself. I mean, obviously, that's factually not correct because nothing heats itself it needs to get the heat from somewhere but a passive house building retains the heat so it doesn't throw the heat away so it needs to be heated from somewhere whether that's like we talked about the internal activities or the sun coming through the windows or whether it's actually having a small amount of heating switched on in the building you're nicking some of my myths before I've even got started. <laughs> what we're going to do um, on Twitter, uh, you have quite a good presence at Elron Burrell. We'll put this into the show notes too. And I am at Ben Adam Smith. But we put a tweet out just to anyone really. What are some of the myths that you've heard or, or people who have had misconceptions? And we're going to try and put some of them straight. So what do you think I'm going to start on? The most common one. Any guesses? Probably windows. Yes. <laughs> okay, this is the myth that you can't open windows. Yeah, we heard that one when we first started as well. And um, we had some internal debate about that as well because it's an easy one to buy into when you talk about a building being sealed and then having mechanical ventilation of some sort in it. And buildings with air conditioning, or even when you've got your car and you've got the air conditioning on, the advice is don't open the windows because the air conditioning won't work. Now, in a passive house, there's nothing to stop you opening the windows and it really depends on the time of the year and what you want as to whether you would want to open the windows yourself. In summer, most likely the scenario in the UK is that you wouldn't have the mechanical ventilation running. You would rely on natural ventilation. So you would need to open the windows then and you'd be encouraged to do so. In the winter, you may find that you don't need to open the windows because there's enough fresh air and it doesn't feel stale or doesn't feel stuffy. Because in winter in a traditional building, and that you tend to open the windows when it gets a bit stuffy, which is the, essentially the CO2 level is getting a bit high. Whereas in the passive house where you've got the constant ventilation in the background, you wouldn't need to do that. But it really is a myth. There's really nothing to stop you opening windows summer, winter, anytime you want to. And um, if you open the windows during winter, then um, you'll have a little bit of cold air coming in. But that's really not an issue as soon as you close the window, which in all likelihood you do when you feel ready to do so because, you know, you'll be getting cold draft coming in. So when you when you've, for whatever reason, you've opened the window to look outside or to experience outside, uh, when you've done with that and you shut the window, there won't be a huge temperature loss in the building and you'll be back up to warmth again fairly quickly. 
Ah, so let's just take a hypothetical question because how is it going to affect the energy performance in the summer, for example? I want my window open at night. In a passive house in summer, in a temperate climate like in the UK, most likely you'd be using natural ventilation anyway in a passive house. And so in summer, having the windows open at night is actually quite a good thing because that brings in some of the cool night air. And then actually you may want to close the windows during the day so that you get less of the warm daytime air coming in and and the house will retain that cool air that you've got during the night. For example, the schools we've designed, which are certified as passive house, the way that works in summer is that there's vents which are manually opened for nighttime to deliberately bring in that cool air and then cool down the inside of the building so that in the morning when you get all these children coming in, a couple hundred kids come in, a couple hundred kids are quite warm, they generate quite a lot of heat, it's good to have the building to start out a little bit cooler. And then through the day, if it's summer, then you know, you'd only open the windows when you wanted to get fresh air coming through, but the rest of the time you know, up to the user really, whether they want them open or not, depending on if they want breeze or if they're doing some work where they want the windows shut. So there's no air, nothing blowing paper around or anything like that. But, um, but certainly opening windows at night in that case is desirable. So we can cross this one off the list and also a slight addition that I can't hear the birds, I don't feel in touch with nature, all of these things. You can walk out the door, can't you? You can open the windows from time to time. We've done this, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, the other thing to say about that is that people talk about this indoor-outdoor connection and um, the schools we've designed to Passive House have got a big sliding door in every classroom so that they can slide that right open, have a couple of metres of really clear area where kids can go to and fro between outside and inside. They can teach outdoors, that kind of thing. Really, really no problem whatsoever in a passive house. (laughs) Good. Sorted that one. What about the aesthetics? Now, my wife would have something to say here, and I find this one of the biggest challenges of persuading her, is that she just, she says they all look horrible. (laughs) Well... (laughs) I think that it is quite true that at the moment, a lot of the passive houses that get publicity or have got traditionally got publicity are from Europe. And so we're looking at German or Austrian buildings quite often. And the German and Austrian aesthetic is very different to the British aesthetic. And I think there's no argument about that. Some people like German buildings, some people don't really. What I think we're seeing in the UK is that the first people to start taking up passive house and pushing that forward, um, the initial attempts at doing passive house may have mimicked or followed that kind of aesthetic a little bit and the designers may have been grappling a bit with a new challenge of meeting pass requirements while also trying to retain their design ideas and their aesthetic and as that's developing more and more of a kind of british style or vernacular or things will develop as people get more familiarity and and designing to pass fast becomes something that's just part of the design process rather than something that, you know, initially may feel a little bit constricting because it's adding another layer of things to think about and deal with. But I do think I can say with a certain amount of pride that the initial archetype passive house building, so three certified schools, are very similar in aesthetic to the previous schools we've designed, which were not passive house at all. And um, I think if you, I mean, I've done a presentation before and I put up a slide which has on the left-hand side a non-passive house building, on the right-hand side a passive house building, both of ours, and says, you know, can you spot the difference? Which one's passive house, which one's not? And actually you can't tell, looking at the outside or the inside of the building, which one's which. And I think that's going to be the same across the world, is that in North America there's a, an uptake of passive house now and there's... Uh, I know coming from New Zealand, there's a couple of passive house buildings in New Zealand. And as they gain more uh, knowledge and familiarity with the standard, they'll start to just appear more normal. And actually, saying that, a lot of North American ones look like North American houses to me. They don't look any different. So I think the aesthetic one is a myth. And um, you can see why it's come about. But um, really, it's a myth. (laughs) Closely linked to that, and it may be because people are trying to drive it further, more sustainable, is actually the materials that you're using. This is perhaps part of it as well, but as you use more sustainable materials, it's just because you're trying to get effectively a a greener building, but you don't have to use wood and straw bales or whatever it might be. No, straw bales are a bad example. (laughs) I know there's some straw bale passive house buildings in in Europe. Yeah, it's interesting because quite often... In my experience, I hear the opposite. I hear that passive house doesn't encourage you enough to use natural materials. And so archetype have always had an interest in using healthier materials. So, uh, so internal materials that don't emit uh, noxious fumes or don't have a knock-on impact with asthma or problems with people's health when they're in the building. 
and we like to use natural materials on the outside as much as possible and, and generally to have a lower impact building on the environment. So the two aspects, the environment and human health. So that's been a driver for us for a long time anyway. So naturally, when we're doing passive house, we carry on using that in conjunction with passive house, but other people don't. And sometimes passive house buildings use types of insulation that have a lot more embodied carbon like polystyrene or other things like that. And so sometimes it gets criticised for allowing that or for not encouraging a move away from that. And there's a, it's quite gets quite complex at that point because actually you need to get a balance between how much carbon might be involved in the materials, like using polystyrene or something similar, and how much carbon is being saved or how much energy is being saved by using such a good insulation material. Um, as I said, archetypes' preference is to try and use materials that are healthy and low impact for the environment, whatever we're doing. So that's our kind of push. But I think that passive house as a standard doesn't dictate which way you should go on that. I mean, there have been some studies done on the embodied energy side of passive house that show that if there's any extra investment of carbon, you might say, in terms of using high impact materials, that it's very quickly evened out by the massive, massive savings in use of energy. Um, but it's really not dictated. So it really comes down to the designer and the client's choices. And, you know, if it's an individual wanting their house, you know, we've got different clients we're working with. Some of them actually want a European aesthetic with concrete and plaster finishes and things. Others prefer a natural kind of timber finish and that. So it's all possible. I'm scrubbing that one off. So let's move on to this. It's a very common one. It comes down to cost. I've had emails about this. Why go down the passive house route? Because it's too expensive. Yeah, and this is quite a tricky one to address often because there's quite a lot of published data which shows passive house buildings can cost more than non-passive house buildings. And I'm not sure I'd categorise it as a myth per se, but I think that it's definitely an aspect of the design of a passive house building that should be addressed and shouldn't be hidden away. There's a few different factors to consider though, is that when you're designing a passive house building, it's a quality assurance standard. So what gets built has to match what gets designed and it has to meet the appropriate standard of um, workmanship on site and finishes, etc., to make sure that the performance matches what's designed. So there's no kind of getting out of designing something and then having a building that doesn't work as well as was intended. And so when you're comparing that with a building, say built to standard building regs in the UK, then there's very little quality assurance that what you get as a finished building matches what was designed at the out outset. So there's an issue there of comparing like for like. So if you compared a building that was designed and built exactly as it was designed, it would probably cost slightly more than, than it does at the moment in one sense. And the other one is that some people are coming at Passive House from the very beginning of trying to design a building and then saying, OK, let's make it Passive House. So how do we make this Passive House now? And if you do anything that way, then that's going to add cost onto it. And you see this in other forms of building. So people talking about zero carbon or low carbon, they kind of design a building that's fairly standard and then they try and add things onto it to make it reach their targets. And that's you're always talking about adding stuff on. And I think that's a real, it's a real um, shackle for the whole green building kind of movement in some ways because there's so many people that approach it from that way and that does look like you're adding costs onto it to make things greener. And I think that um, our approach and the way we would really advocate approaching it is that you need to start from the beginning saying, this is what we're going to achieve and this is the budget we've got to work with and how we're we going to prioritise how we spend that money. And so if you're looking at a traditional building and maybe using double glazing and you look at passive house and say, right, we're definitely going to use triple glazing, you know from the beginning that's the cost of a triple glazed window. You know that's where the money's being invested. So you've got to think, how do we balance that in the overall budget? I mean, we're quite proud that we've delivered schools, three schools now, that have all been on standard school budgets. And each one, the budget has gone lower from the previous ones. We started on, you know, fairly standard budget and then the next one they said actually we want it to be quite a bit lower than that and the next one they said we want it lower and we want it delivered faster <laughs> and each time we've managed to do that so I think we're proving that it is definitely possible but you have to approach it from that kind of way you can't just assume it'll turn out that way you have to be deliberate about your design process if you're working with a domestic client and you establish what the budget parameters are on that. I think it's exactly the same kind of approach is that you look at that, you look at the things that you need to do for passive house and you look at how you're going to manage the budget so that those things are definitely included and possible and you look at how you manage the rest of the money and if you start from that up front then actually you're investing wisely and not wasting money on things that aren't adding value that the client needs. So um, 
we're quite confident that we can deliver Passive House on a standard budget, but obviously that's not always the case in the industry. Okay, that answers that one. What about the air being too dry? I've noticed this before when I've stayed in my parents' house that has a mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, and sometimes you notice it when you go to sleep, and the solution that we had was to put a plant in the room. I don't know where we heard all this from, but uh, it does seem to work. How would you answer that one? Um, this is quite a technical question in a way. <laughs> Maybe more technical than it seems at the outset. Oh dear. And... I don't actually, I mean, I've read about it and I understand the kind of basics of it, but I'm not sure that I'm really the right person to answer that in a great deal of detail, to be honest. But what I would say is that, again, there's a little bit about comparing like for like and that what we're used to is a building that doesn't really perform that well. And actually in winter nights is usually the kind of issue around this one, I think, in terms of we're used to a relatively higher humidity. And if that humidity drops down, we notice that it seems drier than what we're used to. And part of that is because the buildings aren't that great. And so we've got a lot of moisture in the building that we wouldn't otherwise really want there. And that there's mites and potential for mold. And this is why, you know, this is sort of related to asthma and kind of respiration difficulties and issues and things like that. And so if you get a building which is built right and airtight and well ventilated, the humidity will definitely be lower in some circumstances than a building that's not. And that's not necessarily always a bad thing because actually a drier building is te would tend to be a healthier building. But it is possible that if it's not quite balanced or things aren't quite right, that it may be slightly drier than is comfortable. And there has been quite a lot of work done on that for non-passive house buildings and passive house buildings. And the, in the UK, there's a huge number of buildings with MVHR in them now which are not passive house buildings. And so there's a whole kind of issue around ventilation there. What I would recommend, if, if people want to look at that issue in more detail... There's a really good paper published on the AECB website, which perhaps you can provide a link to that, written by Mark Sedell, which looks at the issue of ventilation. And he particularly goes into detail about the humidity issue and the perception or the reality of dry air. And I think that it's an area that's still got some questions in all building types that use heat recovery ventilation and it's not specific to passive houses but I think that there's definitely solutions and it's definitely not as big an issue as it's perceived to be. We've mentioned ventilation there so let's address this one here that it's too noisy and actually it costs more than it saves using mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. Yep, two different two different things there. I think the, uh, the noisy one is quite interesting and I think that in the UK there's definitely an idea that MVHR is noisy and my understanding is that that comes from non-passive house buildings that have got MVHR in them which is probably I'm just speculating here but probably buildings built to a code for sustainable homes level which is requiring that and in that case maybe not enough care about the way the system is designed and installed in a passive house building the MVHR needs to be in a separate cupboard or sometimes it's even outside the building so next to the building rather than in the building and so the where the fans are is acoustically separated from the rest of the building so there is a standard for that required in passive house so and the level that is required for that is lower than what the i think it's the world health organization what their background noise level is for people to sleep comfortably so there's a certain decibel rating that they say you can sleep comfortably with that background noise and the passive house requirement is lower than that so actually in a passive house building you won't be getting that background noise from the equipment i mean the fans are running at incredibly low speed so they're not they're not like whizzing it's not like when you hear a laptop with the fan suddenly buzzing and then in terms of other acoustics between rooms is that when the ventilation system is designed with the ducts where there might be the possibility of sound travelling through the duct from one room to another, there needs to be acoustic attenuation built into the ducts, which takes that issue out. So that's a myth which arises from, as you said, a lot of MVHR installed in buildings in the UK, which are not to passive our standard, don't have that quality assurance on the acoustic side of that. The other one on the costs, um, obviously the MVHR installation in a domestic situation, if you're comparing it to a house where you don't have any mechanical ventilation, is a cost you have to pay for. And we talked about the overall cost of passive house, so that comes into the equation of whether it costs more or not. In terms of the running costs of that, it's actually been shown that the amount of energy saved and the cost of that energy saving is much more than the cost of running the MVHR because the MVHR, as I said, the fans are running at low speed. They're not drawing a huge amount of electricity to do that. 
Just sticking with ventilation, another one that I've got here is that it has to be running all the time. Does it have to be running all the time? <laughs> Yeah, it, it certainly doesn't. I mean, as I've said already, we design our buildings to in the UK to work on natural ventilation in summer and then to use the MVHR just for the winter months, which is essentially, you know, the way you can think about that is that if you open the window and the air coming in feels dramatically colder than indoors, then you know you're losing a lot of heat energy through that and you know also that you're getting a cold draft coming in. So that's the sort of time of the year when actually you'd be wanting the air to be coming through the heat recovery of the mechanical ventilation. If you can open the window and you've got fresh air coming in, it feels comfortable and you know, you're not feel like you've got a cold draft, then probably you don't need to be running the MVHR. So, you know, it might be six months a year, it might be depending on how the year goes, it might be a bit less or a bit more. And um I'm probably going to say something very stupid here, but <laughs> if you've got the windows open at one point and you haven't got the MVHR going and then you close the windows because it's the end of the day, what happens then? You have to go and switch the MVHR back on? Well, in a house situation, that would be the case. You just have a manual thing where you just put it on summer override, so um, or you turn it off, or there's a summer override where it keeps running the ventilation, but you're not doing the heat recovery. So you're just bringing in fresh air with the outdoor temperature rather than doing the heat recovery. But yes, that would be manual. In a, in a school situation, there's a building management system, so that can be programmed. So it has a summer mode and a winter mode. So at a certain time of the year, it would change over from one to the other. And then the other thing is the MVHR usually has another setting, so you can put it on boost. So if you have a bunch of people around, a big party, lots of people, lots of breathing going on, you need a bit more fresh air, put it on boost, so you've got a lot more clean air coming through. So uh, very, very simple controls as well. I mean, that's another thing that's... Uh, as a question mark in the UK, certainly, about ventilation and MVHR is, is it much more complicated to run than just opening a window? And OK, it's different because you're not opening a window, you're switching something on or off or onto high. But the controls are very simple. And um, with a little bit of education and training, I don't think it's beyond anyone's ability to switch it on or off or onto high. And the controls are very similar in that sense to what a boiler would be. And, you know, we're quite often, well, most people I know are used to turning a boiler off in the summer or on in the winter kind of thing, or maybe changing the thermostat. So very similar, very simple. That's good. You've knocked off another one that I've got on my list as well. So we're making really good progress. This is one I like here. It's about having wood burners and stoves. I, we want a wood burner, but it's going to overheat if we have one. Yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one because often we want a wood burner for kind of more emotive reasons because it's nice to sit around a fire or it's nice to sit where there's the feel of heat emanating off something you can put a log on. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a primitive part of our human being that we like to play with fire or have that kind of thing. I mean, the general advice would be that in the UK or you know, in this kind of environment, we really wouldn't advise that you put a wood burner in a passive house building because the chances are that you'd only need to use it for a very short period of time before, yes, you would notice that you're getting a lot of heat out of it and you're keeping that heat. Because you think in a traditional building with a traditional wood burner, you're, the heat's being lost fairly rapidly, so it feels good. And then as you step away from it, obviously it feels cooler. And So probably unnecessary is more so than, than not allowable. The other thing about fires, which people might not appreciate, is that if you've got a wood burner there and you've got a flue which goes from the wood burner all the way up to go through the roof of the building, then the flue's unlikely to be insulated to a very high level. So when the fire's going, the heat's going up the flue and coming out into the room from the flue, and when the fire's not going, you've got the cold outdoor air sitting in that. So it's like a metal pipe full of cold air in your building. So if you want to do that in a passive house, that's either going to need to be insulated to the right level, which means very well insulated, which is possibly costly and possibly technically a bit difficult or you're going to have to take the flue straight out of the fire outside the building and then take it up to the high level and you're going to need to provide the fresh air for the fire because you know a fire like us you know needs oxygen to work so you're going to need to bring that air in from the outside so you're not taking all the oxygen from in the house into the fire you know in a well-constructed building that's ideally the situation anyway otherwise you start to notice the effects of low oxygen levels high carbon dioxide levels when you've got the fire on. We're on to the last couple of myths now. Passive house will only work on a sunny site. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I, find, I mean, it's really interesting, all these kind of things, because you get these both ways in some sense, because, I mean, you've heard that one. And, and just recently, I've had a discussion online with somebody saying, actually, passive house works on any site, and actually, we should be doing passive solar design, and that really needs to be on a sunny site, whereas passive house, you know, who cares what site it's on? <laughs> which I thought was quite interesting because Passive House does optimise the solar gain. So make the most useful benefit from the heat you can get from the sun. 
I think if you were to do a small building on a site which had very little opportunity for getting sunlight, it would be more of a challenge. Um, you know, it would be really have to be addressed on a specific case by case site as to whether it was actually viable or not. And that's a small building. As a building gets bigger, then it changes the parameters slightly because. For instance, when you've got a school, you've got a lot of people in it and the people generate a lot more heat. So the balance between the heat you're getting from the people and their activities in the building and the heat you're getting from the sun changes slightly. Whereas when you've got a building where you've got less people in it, obviously you're relying on getting more heat from the sun because you're getting less heat from the people in the building. So, for instance, um, I mean, we're designing a university building at the moment to Passive House Standard, and some of the rooms in that building are kind of seminar rooms, which some of the time would be unoccupied, and some of the times they have a lot of people in them. So you suddenly get, you know, 30 adults or 60 adults, depending on the size of the seminar room. And if you've got 30 adults all go into a room and they're all in there for a period of time, actually you're getting a lot of heat from those people and you don't actually want any gain from the sun at all. So actually those rooms get positioned on the north side of the building because the solar gains are on the south in the UK to totally eliminate any kind of chance of overheating from the sun. Um, whereas other rooms, you know, go on the sunny side on the south so you get as much of the solar gain as possible. So it may be a problem whether the site's sunny or not, depending on the project, depending on the size, depending on the site, but um, I wouldn't rule it out. <laughs> does, that, does that answer the question? It's I think so, yeah. And we've come to the last one. I imagine that there may be some others that perhaps uh, we haven't addressed here that you can always email in and, and maybe we can pull you back on Twitter to answer those or in the show notes. But this last one, that Passive House is best suitable for a domestic market. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And, and I guess originally the standard was developed with the house, the model of a house in mind because it was, uh, you know, originally looking at houses. But uh, obviously the house part of the German word passive house means building, uh, much like Bauhaus is about types of building or buildings of a certain style. Um, and archetype is a interesting example because all our buildings we've had certified to date, none of them have been domestic buildings at all. So we've got passive house schools. And we've got passive house houses we're working on also, but none to the certification stage yet. Um, and also in the UK, you know, there's community buildings and other education buildings certified passive house. So, I mean, that one really is a myth. And actually designing a slightly larger scale building to passive house is perhaps a little bit easier than designing just a house because of, like we talked about, some of the other parameters involved in a, a building of that scale. Well, we've come to the end. So thank you very much for taking part in this. This has been brilliant. We've blown out some myths. <laughs> All right, you're welcome. <laughs> the show notes for this episode are at houseplanninghelp.com forward slash 25. You can leave a comment at the bottom. And I thought that I would add a story here too, which you might find entertaining, because during that interview, I mentioned how my wife wasn't particularly keen on Passive House and she thought that the aesthetics of a lot of the buildings that she's seen, she doesn't like them. So... This is quite strange because my wife and I have had very similar views about what type of house we would like. And as I've learned a bit more and discovered why we're doing things in a certain way, OK, I've changed. I admit it. I put my hands up. But we had a friend over to dinner at the weekend and a few drinks were flowing. But our friend was asking me about the podcast. So I started to explain that we covered a lot of topics in connection with sustainability and that I'd focus quite a lot on Passive House just because I find it really interesting. And it was at that point that my wife started explaining what it was. And I just thought, don't say anything. Don't say, I'm just going to see how long this goes on for. So I kept quiet. And there she was happily explaining how great it was, at energy efficiency and how you the heat didn't get out because the insulation and air tightness and the mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. I was just, this is brilliant. I'm loving this. So maybe we are turning a corner on what we're wanting in the Adam Smith household. She is after a thatched roof. I must ask this question of someone at some point because thatched roofs, are they difficult? I don't know. We'll have to save that for another podcast. It's certainly going to be environmentally friendly, or I would think so in my mind. But uh, she keeps going on about, we need a thatched roof. <laughs> Before I go, I just want to thank everyone who has given the podcast a review on iTunes. I really appreciate your time for filling this in and doing it, but it does have a big benefit of helping us climb the ranks in iTunes and then other people find the podcast. And hopefully you agree that some of the stuff that we talk about is just important to get that information out there. So if you haven't had a chance to do this, please help us out. Go online and do a review on iTunes.
next time on the podcast from houseplanninghelp.com. My guest is Paul Jennings from Aldus, and we'll be talking about how you achieve airtight buildings. Until then, take care.